All right, welcome to Freedom Talks. Let's pray. <laughs> Bow with me. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the warmth of this building on a cold, cold night. We thank you, Father, for your word, which brings light to our eyes. Father, your teachings are sweet. They're sweeter than honey to us. Father, your precepts, your ordinances are more precious, Father, than gold, than much pure gold. By them we're warned, and in keeping your rules, there's great reward. We love you, Father. We love to talk to you. We love to talk about you. We love to learn about you from your word. We ask, Father, that you watch over the teaching of tonight. Father, watch over my tongue, guard me from foolishness, and help the tone of what I have to say to match with the words that are prepared. Father, if there's anything that I'm saying tonight that is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and of good repute, then let it fall with great weight upon these women's hearts. But if there's anything that I have prepared to say that is sinful or foolish or um, not applicable or any negative thing, I ask, Father, that you just take those words and you just make them flutter away and don't let them stick in these ladies' hearts. I ask, Father, that you guide these teachings to be of your spirit. Father, I ask that you bless the listening that happens tonight, that it will be with open ears to your word, that the ladies will open their minds in discernment, that they won't easily swallow any false teachings from anyone, especially someone claiming to be a herald of your gospel, but that they will look with discernment upon the words somebody speaks, that they'll look with discernment on what I'm about to say and compare it to the scripture and see if what it says is true. And then, Father, I ask that you create just a solid, strong connection between their ears and their heart so that when the truth hits, it goes in the ear and it goes down and it has its full effect in the heart and that people's lives are transformed through the preaching of your word. I pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Tonight we're going to be spending a lot of time in the Bible. So if you brought your Bible, um, turn with me to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6 is where we'll spend quite a bit of our time. Ephesians chapter 6. I don't use a PowerPoint. Maybe that would make it easier to follow along with my, with my references. Ephesians chapter 6. Um, I've decided tonight that I want to talk about making war with sin. Sin is deadly. Sin is present. Everywhere we look, everywhere that we are, sin is there. And it's deadly. It's not something to be trifled with. It's not something to cohabitate with. It's not something to ignore. And in order to make war against our sin, we have to look at it with honesty. Honesty takes courage, right? We need to, we need to find the courage in our heart to be able to look at sin honestly, see it for what it is, and then we need to prepare ourselves to make war against it. So I'm going to read this passage first, and then we're just going to we're just going to talk about it for a while. Ephesians chapter 6 and starting in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. 
And having done everything to stand firm, stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you are able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. With prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. With this in view, be on the alert, with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf, that utterance might be given to me in the opening of my mouth, to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. I want to start in the first verse that we read right there, um, which is, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. I want you to ask yourself in this moment, can I be strong? I think the world has a lot to say about strength. And there's a lot of teachings out here happening on, in places like uh, Instagram or TikTok that would say, you need to just look yourself in the eye every day and say, I'm strong and I'm capable and I'm worthy. But a lot of us, if you're like me, we look at ourselves and we don't see strength whenever we're up against sin. We see weakness. And the sin over and over and over again battles against us and it takes us captive and it leads us in places that we don't want to go and we just feel like we're the, the lackey of, of, of sin. It just says, Vance, go do this thing. And I say, okay, I'll go do that. It says, Vance, go do that thing. Like, All right, fine. We don't feel strong a lot of times. So the question becomes, can I be strong? And the answer from this text is resoundingly, yes, you can be strong. You can be strong in your fight against sin. But the key to your strength here is be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might. So I want to ask you a question. God's might, God's strength, is that just a little bit of strength? Or is it a medium amount of strength? Or is it a lot of strength? It's a lot of strength, right? So if you're strong with the strength of your might, it might be a little bit strong. Or if you're really, really good and you have a lot of might, then it would be like a medium amount of strength if you're using your might. But if you're strong in the strength of his might, then you are really really strong and you will be able to do everything that it says here you will be able to plant your feet you'll be able to stand firm against all the schemes and against all of the different devices that satan uses against your life if you use the strength of his might satan cannot stand against you he will flee he will run away and so will your sin with him be strong can you be strong? Yes, you can be strong. And you will be strong if you call upon the Lord and use His might. You will be weak, though. You will be very, very weak if you look into your own heart and try to find the strength in there. You say, I'm going to try to do this myself. I'm going to try to lift myself up with my own might, with the might of my own strength. It's not going to happen. You have to fall upon God in doing this. And so, you might think of the, the biggest weakling in the world, total sissy, okay? It seems like they couldn't do anything. They couldn't, they couldn't lift a pen off the table, okay? But with the strength of God's might, that person is strong. That person is a spiritual warrior. We're going to keep going, verse 11. So put on the full armor of God so you'll be able to stand firm against all the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. There's a lot of people that the world looks at and says, that's a strong person. You might watch the NFL football games and you look at some of these big linemen and you go, yeah, that's, that's a really strong guy. That's a really strong guy. And how do I know he's strong? Because I see him battling against these other really strong guys, and he just knocked that other one on the ground, right? So the world looks at strength as being something that you're able to, you know, you can lift up really, really heavy things. Or maybe you can, 
you can uh, tackle somebody who's really, really strong and bring them down. Or um, maybe you can stay up, you know, for 16 hours straight, working super, super hard and producing a lot of profit for your company. Or all of these different metrics that we have to measure strength. And Paul here in Ephesians says, that's not what your battle is. You're not, your battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against the guy on the other team in football. Okay? It's not against your boss. It's not against your roommate here. It's not against whoever. Your battle is against spiritual forces of darkness. So if you want to be strong, you have to prepare yourself to be strong in the right way. There's a lot of people who are preparing themselves to be strong in all of the wrong ways. They want to be strong in their social influence. So they spend all their time online trying to boost their, their credibility on social media platforms. There's people who try to be strong by going to the gym all the time and lifting a lot of weights. There's all different kinds of ways that we can try to be strong. But our battle is not against flesh and blood. Our battle isn't against the other people on the other side of the line. Our battle is against spiritual forces of darkness. So if we're going to do true war, if we're going to become truly strong spiritually, we need to know what we're up against. And what we're up against is sin. Tonight's lesson is about making war with our sin. We have to identify it. We have to see what it is. Our enemies are not the people sitting in this room with us, not the people that we left at home. They're not the people who, you know, are not Razorbacks fans or other things, right? Our enemies are Satan and his angels, and the enemy is the sin that lives within our own heart. So we're going to go ahead and take a look kind of at the, at the pedigree of sin in a moment here. But first, I want, I want to look at the first piece of armor that we're going to pick up, right? Because we've decided we're going to make war against sin. And I might give you just a second to kind of identify in your own heart where the sin is, Okay. So just think about that. Where does sin live, live inside of my heart? Okay, how does it manifest itself? I know where I'm speaking, so there's a lot of addiction here, right? There's a lot of sin in regards to using substances like alcohol and drugs, right? There's also a lot of sin in this room about sexuality. I know that. You have sexual sin. I have sexual sin. Everybody here has stumbled in this area. Everybody here has stumbled in areas of self-control, right? And that might have to do with drug use, or it might have to do with the way that you eat food, or it might have to do with the way that you don't hold your tongue, okay? So think about your heart. Where is the sin waging war against you? Where does the sin want to drag you into darkness? And you've got to think about that, and you've got to, I, I want you to kind of keep your finger on that, okay? Because tonight's lesson, I hope, is going to help prepare you and prepare me to make war against that sin. I'm not talking about your roommate's sin, I'm talking about your sin, okay? Because the dangerous sin, eh, I'm not going to hit that just yet. The most dangerous sin out there is not the sin that anybody else is doing. Nobody ever went to hell for somebody else's sin. Okay, you go, or I, I hope that you will not, but people go to hell for their own sins. Okay, so your roommate's sin is not deadly to you. Your sin is deadly to you. So don't be thinking about somebody else's sin. Think about your own sin as we go forward th with this. So let's look at the first piece of armor that we're going to pick up as we prepare to do war against our sin. If you're in, in the chapter with me, it's in verse it's in verse 13. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so you will be able, be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. I want to comment on that. I apologize real quick. Having done everything to stand firm. Okay, he just, he just went all the way to the end, right? Having done everything. All right, so you've already done the whole battle, okay? So let's say you, you gals are here at rehab right now, right? You're in a recovery center you're battling against sin, you hope to defeat it, right? You hope to have the edge. You hope to have that sin under your foot when you get ready to leave these, this building, right? So having done everything, right? You're on your graduation day. You're getting ready to go. Having done everything and the sin is under your foot, Paul says, stand firm. Because what most people do 
And I know this because I worked at a rehab for several years. What most people do is they'll get that sin under their foot and then they'll start to back up a little bit. And they'll start to shift around because it's getting uncomfortable. And that sin wiggles its way out. They don't stand firm, right? They don't stand firm and say, I'm going to keep this ground that I've made. I'm going to stand firm. Instead, they start compromising a little bit. They start flirting with the old sin. They start thinking about it. Maybe they move in next door to the old sin. And before you know it, the sin's back worse than ever. So having done everything, stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with the truth. So the first, the first uh, thing that we're going to pick up, I don't know what you gird your loins, maybe it's like a pair of pants, okay? So first thing you're going to do is you're going to put on whatever you gird your loins with, the truth. The first thing is you got the truth, okay? You're not going to make any headway against your sin, unless you are willing to look at it for what it is, okay? The origin of sin, if you look all the way back to the beginning, the first sin with Adam and Eve, Eve was in the garden, right? She was standing underneath the tree, and God had said, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for on the day you eat of it you will surely die. And Eve was standing there under that tree, and the serpent came up, and the serpent said, hey Eve, did God really say you shall not, on the on the day of this, you will eat of this, you will surely die? Or, uh, I'm sorry, the, the serpent came up and said, uh, Hey Eve, did God really say you cannot eat of any tree in the whole garden? And Eve said, Well, no, no, God said that we could eat of any of them, but just we can't eat of, of this one because we'll surely die. And, and the serpent said, You'll not surely die. But God knows that on the day you eat of it, you will attain wisdom and you'll become like God, knowing the difference between good and evil. So the woman saw that the fruit was desirable to eat, and it was desirable for gaining wisdom, and so she took and she ate. So the origin of the woman's sin, the origin of all of our sin, is deception. We're unwilling to accept the truth for what it is. Instead, we exchange the truth for a lie. Okay? So God gave us a gift. Have you ever received a gift for Christmas or something like that? Okay? And you unwrapped it, and you went, oh, that's not what I wanted, right? But I know they're selling this at Walmart for $23.99. And so I'm going to take it back, and I'm going to exchange it for something that I really do want, right? That's what an exchange is. So God gives you the truth. God gives you what's good. And you take it, and you go, ooh, I don't really want that. And so you take it back to Walmart, and you exchange it for a lie. And you say, I'll take that lie because I like the lie. Okay, I want the falsehood. I don't want the truth. A lot of you are probably at a place here where you are denying the truth for a very, very long time. You may have de denied the truth that you were really suffering from addiction. You might be denying the truth right now about different things that are going on in your heart. Because this is not a, a safe place from your sin, right? Your sin is still around, okay? You might have achieved some safety from the substances that you used and that sort of thing, but this is a wonderful place. I know from inpatient rehabs, these are wonderful places to gossip, okay? You can gossip all the time, man. You can talk about her behind her back, and you can talk about this, and the drama can really, really ramp up, right? So that's one aspect, and there's lots of other aspects where sin flourishes in these contexts. And we have to be willing to look at it with honesty. We have to look it right dead in the eyeball and say, I see you. You're not deceiving me. Okay. I see the truth for what it is. So let's turn to Romans. We're going to go ahead and look. We're going to look at the nature of sin. Okay. That's what it starts with. It starts with truth. We're going to confront sin for what it really is. So we're going to turn to Romans chapter one. Romans chapter one. Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 18, in just a moment. I want to make sure that I hit all my points that I wanted to make. Okay. Romans 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth 
in unrighteousness. Okay, we see three different, three different bullet points on what sin is right here, okay? So, first of all, we see what it does. It pits us against God. God's wrath is manifest against sin. So we know where it's going to end up. It's going to end up with us having to stand in the face of God's wrath. That's a terrible, terrible thing, Hebrews tells us. But it's, what it is, is it's ungodliness and it's unrighteousness. So to know sin, to know your sin, you have to understand these two things about it first. One, it's ungodliness. The first and probably the worst thing about sin and that it, is that it's not according to God's character. It's ungodly. Okay? Godliness are, is things that are like God or pertaining to his character. Ungodliness is things that are against God's character. And that's the worst thing about your sin. There's a passage that says they sin because they don't know the Father. Okay? If you don't know God, if you don't love God for what he is, then your sin is going to run wild in your life, okay? Because it's rooted to ungodliness, okay? You don't care about who God is. You don't know who God is. So why are you going to act like God if you don't know him and if you don't care about him? The second thing that we see about sin here is that it's unrighteousness. They suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So the first thing about sin is it's, it's against God's character. The second thing about sin is that it's not right, okay? Now, that, that may seem just like the most obvious thing in the world. Being the right way, okay? So let's say different things in the world that we might say is not sin, but, but is, is the wrong way, okay? So the right way is if you're running past a bunch of, uh, if you're driving past cornfields, okay, out in the middle of Arkansas, the right way for corn to grow is up in the air, right? If you ever drive past a cornfield and all the corn is pointing off to the side like this, there's a problem, right? <laughs> that corn's not going to grow, okay? The right way for a tree to grow is the roots go down on the ground and the leaves and branches come up, okay, and you get fruit. If you ever see a tree with the branches and leaves stuffed down on the ground and the roots are dangling out, something's wrong with that tree and it's going to die pretty quick, right? So that's how your life is with sin as well. Unrighteousness is when your life is turned on its head. It's upside down. It's not sustainable. It's not the way that you were created to live. It goes against the nature that God created in you and in this world. That's what sin is. It's unrighteousness. It's flipped on its head. It's just not right. Okay? But righteousness, on the other hand, is things being the way that God intended them to be. That's like driving, driving past the cornfield and all the stalks are up in the air and there's little ears of corn going on and you say, okay, looks like that farmer's making some corn. That'll, that'll be good, okay? And we can see this all over, okay? It's right for little children to grow up and to be happy and to have safety in their homes and to have two, two, two parents that love them, okay? That's good and it's right, okay? It's not right and it's not good for little children to have parents who don't love them or parents who um who are not together or any number of things right it's good and it's right in your life to love god and to love righteousness and it's not good and it's not right in your life for you to love what is evil to love sin that's that's god's truth flipped on its head okay and that's the problem that's the problem in all of our sin is not that it, I'm sorry, I'm not going to say what it's not. The problem with all of our sin is that we've flipped something good on its head. We've turned it upside down. And instead of taking the goodness and the righteousness and the godliness for what he's offered, we flip it on its head and we say, no, I want it this way. I want it the deceived way. Okay, so let's keep going in verse 19. <clears throat> They suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. You know what's not godly is not honoring God. 
One thing that's, that's good and right and natural, if you're face to face with the creator of the universe, okay, he's omniscient, which means he knows everything. He's omnipotent, which means that he's all powerful. Okay, and he's standing there in front of your face and you say, man, get out of my way. I've got more interesting things to talk about. That goes against the nature of God, right? With how great he is, it ought to bring us to our knees when we interact with him. And that's good and that's right. And when we refuse to honor him as God, we refuse to recognize him for who he is, we begin to suppress the truth. Because you can't look at what's true and then dishonor God the next moment. Let's keep going. Professing to become to be wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. And this is the dark exchange here. Therefore, God gave them over to the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and they worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. So think about the things that sin is in all of this. Sin is dishonoring God. Sin is exchanging the truth of God for a lie. It's taking, taking God's truth that He gave you, it's unraveling and saying, oh, I don't really want that. And you go exchange it for a lie. Okay? Sin is worshipping idols. Okay? Sin, let's keep going. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions, for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. In the same way, the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned with their desire for one another, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. Okay, sin, another aspect of it, is sexual perversion. Okay, sexuality is a wonderful thing that was created to be shared between a man and a woman in marriage. And anything outside of that union is sexual perversion. Okay? It goes against God's good plan for us. Just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do the things that are not proper. And then he's just going to hit us with a big long list. They're filled with unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, and disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. This is the face of sin. Look at it for what it is. And don't look at it and then immediately think, oh yeah, I know, I know a lady who really, really struggles with, with that. She really needs to straighten out. Look at it and see where this is manifest in your own life. Because this is not a comprehensive list of sin. This is just scratching the surface, okay? There's an iceberg of sin here. And all we see in Paul's description is just a little tiny white white part poking out of the water, you know, and it looks very innocent. And then underneath there's this just giant, mass of sin, okay? And it manifests itself in so many different ways in our lives. So we see what sin is. And that by itself ought to be enough <coughs> to, turn us, to turn us off from sin. You look at what it is and you say, I don't want that. I don't want it. Okay, uh, how, many, how many of you have had to take the garbage out here at John 3.17 every now and then? Okay, yes. So, you get those big black trash bags, probably, right? And it's not during the winter. It's not so bad in the winter because it's cold, you know, all the food kind of freezes. But think about in the summer, okay? It's about 98 degrees outside, and maybe, maybe the girl who was supposed to take out the garbage yesterday forgot it, and so it's been sitting there all day, and they had tacos, okay? And so there's all that slop in the bottom. There's all that slop in the bottom of the, of the trash bag, and you're, you're toting it out. And then all of a sudden, you look at all that slop down there, okay? And you see, I, I'm, I'm making a connection here between, the, between the, the sin, right? The way he describes it and how repulsive it is. You start looking at that slop in that bag and you go, you know, that doesn't look so bad, actually. It looks pretty delicious. And so you get down there and you just start spooning some up, okay? No! Nobody does that. If you do that, you've got problems, Okay? <laughs> Nobody starts looking at that slop and goes, yeah, this looks pretty good, actually. You know, we should start serving this. Okay? 
That's what Paul's trying to do in this passage. He's trying to show you what it is. Because all of us have walked through our lives and we've been eating that slop. Okay, We've just been shoveling it in. And we think that it tastes good. We think that it's supposed to be good for us. And Paul's saying, look at what you're eating. You're eating the slop out of the bottom of the trash bag. You're not supposed to, you weren't created to eat that. Okay, there's a parable about this. You might know the prodigal son. Okay, he goes off into his sin. And at the very end of his road of his sin, he's sitting there over this pig trough, looking down at the pig slop. And he's just going, man, that pig slop looks really good right now. Because I'm so hungry. Right? That's where we get. That's where you've been. That's where I've been. You're looking down at the food, at the, at the pig slop, and you're going, I, I wasn't made to eat this stuff. This isn't, this isn't what I'm supposed to eat. Okay? So we look at the sin, and, and just knowing what it is ought to be enough. We ought to say, yeah, what it is is disgusting, and I'm not going to take any of it. <clears throat> but the truth is, it's not enough for us. Okay? Might be enough for you. It's not enough for me because I find myself sinning all the time. Okay? I've got my nose down in there. Okay? In that gross sin. And I'm indulging in it. Okay? And so God doesn't just leave us there saying, here's what it is. Here's what the sin is. And, here's, and, and if you know what it is, you're never going to touch it. Because He knows we've already touched it. Okay? We've already been eating it. So He says, I'm going to also tell you about what it does. It's not just about what it is. It's also about what it does. So, the first thing that he says in this passage is the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness. Oh, thanks. Thank you. So, if what it is isn't enough to dissuade you from partaking in sin, then look at what it does. It draws the wrath of God down upon you. Okay? So if you're looking in that trash barrel, it's not just that it's gross to eat, but it's also that if you do eat it, you're going to get sick. Really, really sick. If you eat it, you probably die. Okay? If you eat some of that garbage. It's not just what it is. It's what it does. Let me look. Hebrews chapter 10. I wrote Hebrews 26, but I know that must be a verse because Hebrews doesn't have 26 chapters. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10 gives us an image of this wrath that we have to face if we keep going after the sin over and over and over again. Let's see. Hebrews chapter 10, For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. But how much worse a punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? If somebody in the Old Testament was killed for breaking the law, how much worse are we going to have it? when we take Jesus' name and we drag it through the mud. For we know Him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge His people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It's not just what the sin is. It's what it does. And your sin has the dark power to do this in your life. If you don't stand firm, like Paul said, and put on the full armor of God, your sin will come in and it will steamroll you spiritually. And you won't be able to stand. 
But the glorious truth of the passage tonight is that you can stand by the power of God's might. And this does not have to be you. Okay? This does not have to be you. You can stand firm in the strength of God's might. And in the end, you'll be with Him. So it's not just what sin is. It's what it does Let's take a look real quick at where sin lives. Okay, we're back in Romans. Chapter 6, verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. There's a war that's happening, whether you like it or not. Okay? And the war is happening over the real estate of your heart. Okay? Your heart is like a castle. Okay? And God really desires that castle. He wants to live there. He wants to take His throne, and He wants to set it right down there in the castle of your heart, and He wants to live there, and He wants to reign. Okay? And he wants for all of the different subjects of that kingdom, which Paul says here are like your members, okay? your arms and your legs and your fingers, and your toes and your nose and your sexual organs and your brain and your eyes. Okay? He wants all of these things to be servants of his and he wants you to use them in ways that are glorifying to him, in ways that bring true and lasting joy into your life. So God wants for you to to be his, right? He wants to reign in your heart. But Paul says there's another entity that wants to reign in your heart as well. Okay, in verse 12, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Okay, so sin would also like, or Satan would also like to take his throne, and he'd like to plant it right there in the middle of heart. And then he would like to take all of the servants, right? Which is your arms and your legs and your mind and your nose and your eyes. He would like to take all of the members of your body, and he would like to use them as, as servants or as slaves to accomplish his purposes, right? So there's a war that's happening. And the war is happening within your own heart. So as you prepare to make war against your sin, understand where that war is going to take place. You don't have the luxury of fighting this battle on somebody else's turf, right? Here in America, we've, had, we've been blessed in many ways that we have fought very few wars in recent years on our own turf. Almost always, we're going overseas and fighting the wars over there, okay? Because a war is an ugly, ugly thing when it comes to your homeland, okay? All the buildings are shattered with bombshells, okay? Civilians are hurt. Innocents are hurt, okay? Industries collapse. It's a terrible, terrible thing for, for a war to take place in your own homeland. But that's just the reality of it. This war is going to take place in the battleground of our hearts. And we have to prepare ourselves to fight the war there, okay? And if we turn elsewhere... We try to fight the war in somebody else's heart, okay? So my contribution to, you know, God's kingdom is I'm going to go and I'm going to fix my, my neighbor, Lindsay, right? No, that's not going to work, okay? The war takes place in your own heart. You have to fight the battle there. So if you go looking for sin and you say, I'm ready to fight, okay? Bring it on, sin. Let's do it. You could find sin all over the place, okay? You can find it. Uh, you can find it in your roommate. You can find it in you know, politicians, you can find it at the grocery store, you can find sin everywhere. But all of that sin is bad, okay? And it's deadly. But it's not deadly to you. The sin that is the most serious that you have to deal with is the sin that's living right here. Sin that's living right there in your own heart. So we're, we're going in a, in a wrong direction if we say, yeah, I'm going to go do battle against sin, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go get a sign that says, you know, God hates homosexuals, and I'm going to stand out on the road, and I'm going to do battle against sin of homosexuality, okay, out there in front of the church or whatever. That's doing battle with sin the wrong way, right? Because we're trying to battle against somebody else's sin. God says, do battle against your own sin, okay? Start doing battle against your own sin. So let's keep going. Let's see. Um, what am I doing on time here? What time is it? 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Okay. So, the real estate of your heart is where the war takes place. Rachel might enjoy this story. So, not long ago, we had 
uh, we had an unwelcome roommate in our house, okay? And I'm going to liken this to sin, which is cohabitating with us. So uh, one day, Rachel's cleaning up, and she notices that there's a lot of little black specks underneath our recliner, okay? And she says, Vance, we've got a rat. I said, how do you know that? She says, well, we've got all this rat poop down here. You don't know that's rat poop. That could be blah, 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 right? And so Rachel was prepared to make war against this rat, okay? Now, I was kind of a weakling about it, okay? I was like, eh, I mean, it's just one rat, you know? Like, what's the big deal? And so before too long, there's more poop, right? And then we're watching a movie one night, and you hear something scurry across the floor, you know? And you start getting a little less comfortable with living in the same house as this rat, right? And then you start noticing that, like, the, the granola bars, you know, a little corner's been chewed off of them, and, and he started eating the granola bars, and you start going, all right, you know? It was okay living with this rat at first, but he's just getting more and more presumptuous. It seems like he wants to make this place his home, right? This is our sin. It seems okay at first. It's not a big deal. And then it gets more and more and more, and next thing you know, it's sitting in your recliner, and you're saying, where am I supposed to sit, Okay. So one night, the, 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 we see this rat. I, I forget. Oh, okay. So we started laying out traps, and you could hear these things snap. So in the middle of the night, this, this snaps, and I go, all right, we got him. And I go out there, and this was a wily rat. Okay, he could, I mean, he might be the personification of sin because he was very, very smart. And this guy knew how to set off the trap and then steal the food. And so I rush in there, and I don't see him, and I'm looking all over. And then I see him dart across the, the room that way. And so I'm after him with a broom. And I'm ready to make war against sin in this moment, right? I've got my broom, and I'm going to kill this thing, okay? <laughs> and so I go after him, and he scurries away, and he escapes. Well, the same thing happens a few nights later, and he gets into the oven, and I'm sitting there wrestling with him. You know, I grab him by his tail, and he's like inside of the oven, and I've got him by the tail. I'm trying to yank him out, and his tail, like, all right, I, I don't need to get it too much into this. Okay, I apologize. You get the picture. You get the picture. I'm, I'm cohabitating with a rat. He lives in my house. Okay? And I'm okay with it for a while as long as it's just a few turds under the couch. But when he starts to eat the food and we start to scurry across the floor when we're watching movies and he starts to really upset my life, I've got to get serious about it. Okay? I've got to get serious about my sin too. Because it's okay to cohabitate with my sin for a while, but over time, I've got to start getting serious about it. Okay? Because that sin is going to take more and more of my life away from me. And I need to make war against it. And I need to take it seriously. I don't mess around with it. I don't joke about it. I don't treat it lightly. If I'm serious about getting this rat out of my house, I'll do what Rachel did, which she put flour across the floor to find out where he was going in the middle of the night. She track his little footprints. And then she put out all these traps all over the place. And then one night, sure enough, she got it. Okay? And she made war against that rat, and she won in the end, right? <laughs> but at that moment, let's go back to stand firm. And having done everything, you're standing over the corpse of this rat, and you're saying, I finally won. Stand firm. Go and plug up the hole, okay? How did this rat get in here? Why is he coming in here? Are we leaving food out on the counter? We've got to keep the progress that we've made, okay? We don't just be satisfied with where we've landed at the moment. Okay. So don't live with a rat. Let's get back to Ephesians since we're running close on our time and we're going to finish this thing off. Ephesians chapter 6. Take up the full armor of God so you'll be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded up your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. We've talked about righteousness, okay? These are all defensive pieces of armor that we're going to put on, okay? When we're doing war against our sin, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Don't have areas of your life that you say, this is a really, really big deal, okay? I'm not ever going to get back to meth again, okay? A lot of times we'll say, I'm never going to do meth again because that's a really, really big deal. But it's not a really, really big deal for me to be gossiping about my roommate, okay? It's not a really, really big deal for me to be honest about what I took for dinner or, you know, I don't know. Pick something, okay? Pick something that for you seems like, and eh, it's not really a big deal. Not a really, really big deal to do this other thing. 
it is a big deal. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Don't let there be any of your vital organs that are uncovered. What warrior would go into battle with a breastplate of righteousness that's got a big old huge hole in it right here? He says, yeah, as long as this stuff is covered, I'm good. I don't really care if I get hit by a sword right here. Okay, no. You need to cover your whole body with that breastplate, okay? So think about the different areas of your life that you're leaving exposed to attack by the evil one. And shore it up. Get a good, big-sized breastplate that covers everything so that you're able to repel all of the Satan's attacks. Okay? Uh, where were we? Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So we've started af looking after our own lives and taking care of our own sin. And now we start to look outward. We say, I'm going to put on the shoes of the gospel of peace and I'm going to start taking this to other people. I'm going to start showing what other people can accept. I'm, I'm going to show them how they can accept Christ to be their own. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you'll be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Faith. Faith is the victory. We sing that song often. Faith is our shield. Okay, he's shooting arrows at you. He's shooting falsehood at you. He's shooting lies at you. Okay, lies like maybe it's not a big deal if you do this thing, or lies like you'll never be able to be strong in the Lord and the strength of His might. Okay, because He doesn't love you. Lies like um, whatever the lie might happen to be for your life. Okay, get your shield of faith. Put it right there in front of your body so when those lies come in, like flaming arrows, they just go ka-ping and land off there. Ka-ping, okay? You've got the strong shield of your faith. And faith is the conviction of things hoped for, the assurance of things not yet seen. So in order to have faith, you have faith in a person. You have faith in God, okay? Number one, that God's real. Number two, that God's statements, the things that He says are true. He says so many things. He makes so many promises, and they're all good. They're all good to the very end. God loves you, okay? God chose you to be His child before the foundation of the world. He set you aside to be a member of His church. You can cling to promises like this, okay? And you can bolster your faith, and it can become a strong, big shield that none of Satan's arrows can shoot through. Take the helmet of salvation, Okay, put that on your head. Put your salvation on your head and let it guard your thoughts. Okay, knowing that I'm God's child and I know that I'm saved. Salvation is a big fancy word that means you're saved. Okay, he came and he saved you and you have a room up there and he's preparing it for you right now. Jesus says to his disciples in my father's house, there are many, many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I'm going up there now, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. So that where I go, you can come and be there with me as well. So think about Jesus up there, and he's in your room right now. And he's putting the sheets on the bed, okay? And he's putting the pillows on just like you like it. And he's folding the towel up to look just like a monkey, and he sets it there. He's preparing a place for you in his Father's house. And you can wear that salvation on your head like a helmet, and it can guard your mind, and it can guard your head. I must be almost out of time. Okay. Helmet of salvation and take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, out of this whole list, the sword is the only weapon that you use to attack somebody. Okay? All the rest of the stuff you use to protect yourself. But the sword, you're going to use this to attack Satan right where he is. You remember how Jesus used the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, when Satan came to him? Satan came to him and offered him three temptations. Okay, and now I'm going to forget them because I'm trying to say them from memory. All right, so he came up and he said, Jesus, you're really, really hungry. You haven't eaten in 40 days. Just turn a little bit of these, little bit of these uh, stones into bread. Jesus said, no, I'm not going to do that. And he defended himself with the word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God, says Jesus. And then Satan he takes him up to the top of the temple and he says, just throw yourself on down because God says he'll command his angels concerning you and they, they won't let you strike one foot against, foot against the ground. Jesus says, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. 
use the, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, do battle against Satan. Okay? And Satan brings him on top of a tall mountain, and he looks at all the kingdoms of the whole world. And he says, Jesus, if you just bow down to me, all of this will be yours. This will be your dominion. And Jesus says, it is written, worship the Lord your God only. And then Satan left him, right? Jesus took up that sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and he plunged it right into Satan's heart. Okay? You can do war with the armor of God. You can protect yourself, and you can do battle against Satan. 1 Peter chapter 5. You might not have time to turn there. I might not have time to turn there. Whatever, I'm just going to butcher it from memory. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking those to devour. Resist him, and he will flee from you. Okay? You resist him with the word of God, and he will flee from you, because Satan is not strong in the might of the Lord. Satan's a coward. He comes at you with lies. He comes at you with deception. He doesn't come at you full on front. He's not going to bowl you over if you're standing firm. If you plant your feet and stand firm and you put on the full armor of God, Satan doesn't stand a chance against you. Okay? Because you're strong with the strength of God's might. So let's finish this. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on, the, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And listen to this. This is the Apostle Paul, okay? The Apostle Paul, and pray on my behalf, that utterance might be given me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. So Paul says, I need boldness, guys. Okay? I need boldness because there's a lot of people out there who really hate me. And he doesn't say this here, but I, I sense a note that maybe he's a little bit afraid. These people have the power to kill him. Ultimately, they will kill him. Okay? Paul says, I need your help if I'm going to do war against my sin. So the last little piece, maybe of our puzzle, looking at how to make war against our sin tonight, is pray for others. Okay? Look at this room around you. Look at the people in here. Each person here has a lot of sin to make battle against. Okay, There's not one person in here who's pretty well got it on lockdown and they've only got a couple loose ends to tie up in regards to their sin. We've all got serious, deadly sin living in our lives and we can't do it alone. There's only one way we're going to do it and that's by standing firm in the Lord and in the strength of His might. In order to do that, we need each other to be praying for one another, okay? With all times with prayer and petition, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So, I pray for all of you. I'll end with a prayer. Check my time one more time. I'll end with a prayer. I hope that you can be encouraged that you can make war against your sin, and that it's a serious matter. I can share a, a confession from my life that I've been struggling the last many months with sin of um, uh, lack of self-control. Is there a word that means not self-control? I've been giving in to all sorts of impulses to just eat whatever's in front of me and come home and, and stress eat. And then I hear my alarm in the morning. I don't want to get up out of bed. And I'm, I haven't been disciplined in the way that I've been living my life. And I keep thinking, well, maybe there's a way that I can just have my circumstances kind of change. And then one day I'll wake up and I'll be like, oh, it's just easy now. I'm just going to, I'm just going to get up on time and I'm just going to eat a healthy amount of food and, and do all the things that I'm supposed to do. And I feel like I was given clarity. I confessed my sin to an elder at my church recently, and he said he was going to pray for me. And I got a lot of clarity last week that the problem with my sin is not that I'm just in some bad circumstances right now, and if a few things kind of sorted themselves out, then I would be good. The real problem with my sin is I'm not treating it as if it's an enemy that I need to make war against. I'm treating it like it's somebody that I'm kind of happy to live with, okay? Or maybe I don't really like the sin a ton, but I don't mind him as long as he stays there under the cupboard where the rat's nest was in our house, okay? As long as he kind of stays out of sight, most of the time I'm okay with cohabitating. And I realized if I'm going to conquer this sin, 
I have to look at it for what it is. This is my enemy, and the only way to defeat my enemy is making war, to put on the full armor of God, to stand strong and firm in the strength of his might. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time in the word. We love you, Father. We ask that you strengthen us with your might to do war against our sin. Father, I know that there are dozens and dozens of, of ways that sin has manifest itself in each of our hearts. Some of them are so obvious to us, God, and we look at it every day and we just feel weak to fight against it. And Father, I ask that you strengthen us against those big, weighty sins that continually push us down. And I ask by the power of your Spirit, Father, that you move into our hearts and put strength where there's weakness and help us to to climb up above that sin and to defeat it and then to stand firm. And Father, I ask for the little areas of sin in our lives where where we don't even recognize that sin has a hold in this particular area or contour of our hearts. God, I ask that you give us eyes of truth that we'll be able to see what's in there and we'll be able to make war against those sins as well so that when, Father, our time comes to meet you, we'll be sanctified and we'll we'll be already the sort of people that you want us to be. And so the step into eternity will just be this, uh, another step in the same direction. Father, we thank you so much for this night. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.